You're listening to Inside the Minds Podcast with Dante Marsh and Ryan Hyde, where we talk about sports, life, and whatever the hell else we want to talk about. Today's guest on the Inside the Minds podcast is an international karate champ in 1987 and 1990. He was the World Kickboxing Federation Super Heavyweight Champ in 1993. He fought in UFC 1 and UFC 9 and has a fourth degree black belt in Kenpo Karate. Please welcome to the show, Zane Fraser. Hey, how you doing? How you doing, Ryan? I'm good, Zane. Thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Great. Good to have you on today. And uh, yeah, let's get this going. A couple corrections on the Kempo Karate, six degree black belt in Kempo Karate. And the international champions, I won four of those. Okay. So that was, so when you read that, when you hear that, it's a four time, I won the international four time and I won the worlds that were only held twice, which is in 1987 in Seattle. And they did them back to back again in 19... I want to say 1987 and 1989, they had the Worlds in Seattle. And that was, uh, I won those, both of those two things. And then I won a the WFC uh, World um, uh, title for MMA uh, in Colorado and 2005 MMA World Champion as well. Yeah. Uh, and then, I've, and so those are the, those are the other things that, that I forgot to, I forgot to mention that. Of course. All right, so Zane, tell us a bit about your childhood and where you grew up. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. My parents were divorced when I was very early, so um, I kind of was a kid that grew up in West LA slash Beverly Hills, Hollywood, and then um, then my I would stay with my mom, who's in South Central. So I was lived in back and forth. Dad's on the weekend, and and you know Hollywood land, Beverly Hills. My mom was in South Central, Los Angeles. Yeah. Everybody wants to say what's South Central near the Crenshaw District area. Okay. So there's obviously a lot of, uh, you know, gang stuff going on, um, a lot of bad stuff going on. You know, you could have gone down any kind of which road. and Well, gangs were different back then. People forget gangs didn't get bad till the 80s. And that's when the drugs got into the game. Gangs was something different back then. When I grew up in gangs, and we were all gang members. We all were part of because it was part of a different movement. Uh, Crips stand for uh, community revolution and progress. It was a neighborhood watch. It was a way to protect the community. So we were all gang members. We were all fighting particular that particular fight that our parents fought during the civil rights movement, which was where the Black Panther Party came down in 1969. And then they taught us, actually there's a video or a documentary called Bastards of the Party. If people look at that, they'll see the evolution of how that started. Now there's some controversy with law enforcement as how that really started. But for us, we were all in the gang. We were all part of that movement. So it wasn't, it wasn't until, like I said, I was playing basketball in college by that time that the gangs really got bad and became more like drug cartels at the time. Okay. So how old were you when you got into fighting? Well, I, I was always street fighting as a kid because my mom had nine sisters and they all taught us how to fight. And my mom and I, um, uh, when we lived, when I lived with my mom and my brother, and my sister, we had to fight and we couldn't, we couldn't start away, we couldn't start a fight and you couldn't run away from a fight. And one day I was running away from a fight from a big kid who back then in Hawthorne, which is the only school that would take me because I got kicked out of all the other schools for fighting. Uh, my mom caught me running from this big kid uh, and a big white kid. He was calling, chasing me, calling me in word. And my mom just happened to catch me running from the fight. And so long story short, 
Uh, she went and got an extension cord and then went down to the parents uh, of, the, of the kid I was running from and knocked on his door and made us fight in the, made us fight in the front yard. And my mom told me if I take one step back, she was every time I took a step back, she'd beat me with the extension cord. And that's just how that was done back then. So you don't run from fights. So fighting, I'd always been doing. Organized karate came later because when I got when you got caught outside of your neighborhood or you got caught out something and some kids want to jump on you because that's what you part of one street, then it's now fighting multiple fighters. So my mom took me to a Bruce Lee movie. Um, it was Chinese Connection. It was in, I was, let me see, I came out in 72. So that was, I had to be 10. And then my mom thought that if I could fight, if I could learn martial arts, I can fight more than one guy because I could fight one person. That was easy pretty much, but fighting multiple guys, that's what she thought martial arts could help me fight multiple people. So that's when my organized karate started was in 1972. And I trained with my cousin, Bob Owens, who was part of the Magnificent Seven that included the five founders of the, of, of the BK, of the Black Karate Federation, Steve Sanders, uh, uh, Ron Chappelle, Donnie Williams, Cliff Stewart, Jerry Smith, um, uh, my cousin was uh, Ron Chappelle. My cousin was uh, Bob Owens and Big Willie Smith. That's called the Magnificent Seven. And they used to train in a park in Van Ness. And that's where I started training. And then later on, we moved to Pepperdine University, which was the Pepperdine University that we think of as the one in Malibu. That campus was originally in South Central on Manchester and Vermont. That's where we started to take karate at the end. That's where my organized karate training came from. And that was the time when there was, you know, bare knuckle fighting was, that's all it was. Kar gloves were not allowed in karate studios in the seventies at all. So that was all bare knuckle sparring back then. Wow. So that's my, that's what, that's when my official, official karate training started was in 72. Okay. So that extension cord thing, I mean, up here in Canada, uh, I'm, I'm 42 years old, but I've never heard anything like that. Like, you know, backing up out of a fight and your mom hitting you with an extension cord or, you know, whipping you. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty crazy. That's some tough love right there. Yeah, because yeah, because that was the thing she you couldn't you couldn't back down from a fight. Uh, and you and you don't start fights, but you can't back down from them. And we made and she made you fight because my, my mom. So how she grew up back when she grew up in high school that in the 50s and things like that you didn't get chore you didn't get money for your uh, allowance for chores chores is what you did so if my mom and her sisters wanted to earn money they had to fight and so my grandfather would make them fight on friday nights for a quarter a dime 15 they would because it was mostly it was all girls and they had two brothers um they would have to put socks on their hands so there was no scratching. So it just ball up your fist and fight. So they were fighting for allowance also to make the clan tougher. So we, that's how my generation of my mom grew up. My dad simply grew up the same. He had 16 siblings. They grew up the same way because he was from uh, 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 West Oakland. And so that's kind of where they grew up and, he, and, and they had to fight like that. So my parents on both sides made us have to fight like that. So my dad put me in, then my dad decided to put me in boxing because Muhammad Ali, he was friends with Kenny Norton's crew and that kind of people. So my dad had me in boxing. My mom had me in karate because she didn't believe in karate. My mom believed that Bruce Lee could beat up Muhammad Ali. My dad said, there's no way that Muhammad, uh, Bruce Lee could beat up Muhammad Ali, da, da, da. That's how that thing started. So when I was with my dad, he, I couldn't go to karate classes. I had to go to boxing classes. And then when I was with my mom, I went, couldn't go to boxing class. I had to go back to karate classes. So that later became kickboxing or full contact karate wow okay uh so who do you think would be you know are you a bruce lee or, or muhammad ali who would win well i can tell you this for a certain thing here's what i'll here's it i gotta keep this some of this i'm privy to a lot of stories that some people won't want to comment on but here's what i can say to you we know that bruce lee and muhammad ali did train together at some point in time so okay. we know that so so what i when i understood that i was a fan of both people so now let me, we say, well, what, what does that have to do with your question? If you go back and look at End of the Dragon, yeah, you see, and Bruce Lee's fighting uh, uh, Bob Wall, which is, a, Bob Wall's a good friend of mine, and uh, we used to train with Bob Wall at Gene LaBelle's uh, 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 studio in Cal LA. Um, you see Bruce Lee's uh, influence um, 
with boxing, and you also see uh, his footwork Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, with Muhammad Ali, excuse me. And so I was a fan of that. And so um, long story short, you also see that Muhammad Ali trained with George Dillman and June Rhee and those guys. He's throwing karate punches at the same time. Yeah. So a lot of stuff. So if you see that, and my, we knew that growing up as a kid because that was the rumor. Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali are training and nobody knew where and everybody was trying to figure out why. But it happened right around, I think, the beginning somewhere in 72. I think what right around... That's what the, that's what I was told to me, seventy two right before. Uh, let me take that back. That was I'm taking back. No, it was early seventy three, okay. uh, somewhere in between the first quarter, something seventy. Because Bruce died in July, and then Kenny Norton and Ali had a rematch a month after Bruce Lee died. So I want to say, I don't forget, I'm kind of hazy. I was told that they were training together back in seventy seventy three, early seventy three either before the first fight with Kenny for Norton or shortly after that. Okay. But I don't know. That's what I was told. And why wouldn't they have been? You got two of the greatest, you know, it, it, right? Because, so. well, you got to remember the time period that you got to remember the time period at that time, you have to keep in mind that martial arts was thought to be inferior to boxing. Okay. So the fact that Bruce Lee would train to Muhammad Ali would make Muhammad Ali subject to martial arts. And remember, Bruce, if Bruce Lee doesn't pass away in July 20th, 1973, Inner Dragon might not be a big hit as it is today. It's still a great movie. But what made that so, so uh, uh, over the top is everybody thought Bruce Lee, it was a publicity stunt. And he was going to show up at uh, at, the, at the movie theater in Hollywood and do, uh, do a martial arts demo and that Bruce Lee would be alive again. Yeah. Remember, he died in, he died in what, August? Uh, let me see, he died in July 20th, 73. So Bruce Lee, so the movie came out, I believe, August 5th, 1973, about two weeks later, two yeah. and a half weeks later. So that's kind of why it blew up like it did. And then when it blew up like that, then in the week, see, we're talking about it some you know, 40, 50 years later, you know, it's because of the fact that those guys, you know, those guys are now icons and or icons and idols and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you were recruited to play college basketball at the University of Idaho in Moscow and later tried out for the New Jersey Nets. What made you pick martial arts over basketball? Well, I always, I had, I was, I was reminded of this by my father and I didn't agree with him. And he says, you're not, um, uh, he always thought that I was a basketball player who was fighting martial arts. My mother used to tell me that I was a fighter playing basketball and I didn't know who to believe. It wasn't until I got into college that um, I got into a fight over a girl who wanted to be my first wife and we got into a fight uh, with a football player and um, I got beat up by a bunch of football players and my face was so swollen and I long story short my theater arts professor there was a guy who was doing our stunt choreography there to, in the at the University of Idaho he was also at a martial arts studio in town and it was the Tai Kung Fu studio that had and it was an ad in the school school paper of boxing kickboxing kung fu grappling street fighting so I go to him and I say hey I want to be the best street fighter in the world he kind of says what happened did you get beat up I go yeah and he started laughing so we started training there so I started training that because keep in mind my instructor Bob Owens had died in 78 so I had stopped, I was trained from about 72 officially to about 78. And then I stopped because my, back then you didn't train with anybody else because of the fact that that's just the way karate was. It was very, very uh, uh, singular system oriented that you train with one person until you got your black belt. So when Bob died, I got myself back and I was playing basketball. And so um, uh, when I got back into college in 19, the, the April of 19, uh, 81 that's why I picked martial arts back up again and started training again and back then he said in order to be a great street fighter you got to have to fight competition and so I fought into a I fought my first amateur kickboxing or full contact karate champion this is kind of the same sport and then I, my first fight I knocked the guy out in 52 seconds I'll never forget it and everything the room just kind of really moved very slowly yeah and I said to myself, and I remember saying to myself, I could see everybody. I says, you know what? 
this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And at that point, even I love basketball, I realized basketball is what I love to do, but fighting was actually my passion. Right. And that was the difference there. That was the moment that I made that decision. Wow. That's crazy. And they say, you know, to follow your passions, right? Follow your dreams and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's Absolutely. what you did. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you first hear about the Ultimate Fighting Championship? I didn't. Um, so Horian, Horian Grace is a funny story. Horian Grace, it keeps me from going to jail uh, because I was fighting at the International Long Beach Internationals in August of 1992. I was fighting for first and first and second place. Now, back then, the karate tournaments back then, what we call, they let you hit hard. And even semi-contact semi was... Um, harder than full contact is one, it was based on speed. Two, you can hit hard. Three, you just could knock a person out or draw blood. So you could get hard guy. There was more death and injury in tournament karate back in those days than it was in full contact, kickboxing, Muay Thai combined. So um, me and this guy uh, named Woody Sams, he and I used to battle it. We used to always would come down here and I first in place. And so long story short, we got into it after one of the breaks and it turned into a street fight. And then, so I start. I got on top, after I took him down to the ground and, and kind of what we call knee on the belly is what we call it now, but that was knee on the chest, punch, 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 elbow, elbow, and stomp, stomp. And he was he, and not, you know, he was out. And then, so they, they banned me from the arena and then they had called the LA County Sheriff Department to escort me out. And they had, uh, it, um, the ambulance that came in and take Woody out. And Woody was a good guy. I'm not trying to disperse Woody, but that's just how he and I used to go at it a lot of times. And so um, um, Horan Gracie saw me and it was kind of funny because he was in this kind of funny kind of judo kind of karate gi where his gi pants was all the way up by his knees almost, right? He was tall and skinny and he talked in this funny accent. And so the LA County Sheriff Department was coming to escort me out. And so Horan Gracie put his arm around me and said, follow me. And so he had this booth out in the place where they're in, like in the uh, uh, foyer where they have the booth. They sell martial arts equipment, books and things like that, videos at the time. And he helped, he hit me in his booth and he said, hey, watch this. And it was called Gracie in Action 2. And I was watching that video and the, the deputies, there was another fight that broke out in the tournament. So they forgot about me and Horan Gracie. Uh, said, what do you think about that fighting? I says, where did they do that? He goes, he goes, he goes, we do that in my home country in Brazil. So what's it called? He says, it's called Valley Tudo. And I said, really? I want to do that. Where can I do that? He says, oh, we do that in Brazil. I said, oh, man, I can't afford to get down to Brazil. He goes, you don't have to. I said, he said, um, I'll fly you down there um, and you can fight there. I said, really? I said, man, but I don't know any, I don't have anybody, I don't know anybody, and I don't have any place to stay. He goes, oh, we'll put you in a hotel. I says, oh, man, I want to do that. He goes, you don't have to go to Brazil to do it, because we're going to bring it here next year. I go, what? He goes, we're going to bring this right here next year to America. I says, get out of here, man. I said, I just got disqualified for beating a guy up at a karate tournament. You're going to make, make me believe we're going to do no rules fighting? So that was August of 92. Okay. So, um, 93, January of 93, we get a call and my instructor says, hey man, you want to street fight for money? I go, yeah, heck yeah, we could do that. That's what I've been training for all these years, you know? And he goes, well, it's on. There's something called the Ultimate Fighting Challenge. That's what it was called at the time. Ultimate Fighting Challenge. It wasn't called the Ultimate Fighting Champion. It was called the Ultimate Fighting Challenge. And he goes, yeah. So what he goes, he goes, no rules. He goes, you can do anything you want to the guy. You just can't bite. You can't eye, eye gouge and you can't fish hook. Everything else will go. I said, sign me up. So that's kind of how I first started. It was January of 93. And so the fight had got pushed back, pushed back. We didn't think it was going to happen. Then it got pushed back to July. But then what happened to me, I had respiratory failure in February of 93. And we didn't tell the Gracies about it. And when I came out of it, I, almost, I died. I almost I went, you know, coded out and came back. When I, by the time I got out of the hospital, the fight hadn't happened yet. And so um, we didn't tell anybody about it. And so they pushed it back. It was going to happen in August. And finally, they got the date in, in November of 93. And that's when, you know, we had contracts. We signed all the paperwork and stuff like that and kind of charged in the promo. So that's how, that's how that kind of started. Um, from that, that's when I first heard about it was in January of 93. Okay. That's crazy to think, you know, um, having a, like a tournament style, uh, event, you know, you, you, you fight, you win, you move on kind of thing. You fight three, four, five times in a night. 
uh, that that's pretty intense. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was intense, but you know, it, that's the way it was meant to be. Cause here's what we already knew fights. We thought is what, is what we thought, you know, cause me being a bouncer in a nightclub and fights didn't last that long. And it, and there was times we just weren't fighting guys who didn't know how to fight. We fought guys with skill. So, you know, when you start, when you know, when there's no rules and you kick into the groin and, you know, you're blending different grappling arts and striking arts together, which is what you see now, and you're dumping guys on the head, fights don't last long. So it was about getting in and getting out, putting the guy out and putting him down. That's what we, what, at least what we thought. And, and truth be told, that's what actually happened in that. If you look at all the matches, except for my, me and Kevin, me and Kevin duked it out. But if you looked at uh, uh, everybody else in fight, it was quick. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, and that's how street fights were supposed to go, quick. Right. So what about, um, you know, getting injured in that fight, winning the fight, and then moving on to your second fight? Um, I mean, that potentially that could be, you know, harmful. Do you have any concerns about that? No, because we had a strategy for that. So, so this is, goes into how the rules, the rules, because the Gracie's changed the rules the night before the fight. And I had a lot to do with that simply because of the fact that my coach was an old school uh, uh, Mexican fights coder of a uh, Mexican fighter. He's a Kempo, you know, he's a grandmaster in Kempo 10th degree. Uh, he passed away, like I said, a couple years ago, but he was also a boxing guy. He was a, bo he was a boxing guy first and uh, uh, kickboxing and then Muay Thai guys. Well, they all were into that and they get into Kempo to actually have a job. So they blended the arts together like back then. So he had a, told me, he's, what we were, our strategy was, he brought a, we brought a case of, of white tape and we put it in water. Okay. And we let the, let, let the, let the tape get moist. Okay. And then we, and then we set it on the heater to let it dry. And then right before, so it hardens the tape, right? Yeah. So, so when I, so when I would go to, uh, was a guy named Mike Jones Studio, who's what the studio that we were allowed to train at. Uh, or the designated school to train for the UFC. I was wrapping my hands and my coach would wrap my hands to the point that the tape were, were hardened and it was a cast. Okay. You gotta, you gotta remember, there are no rules. Right, yeah. You gotta remember, there are no rules. Yeah. Only three rules was no eye gouging, no fish hooking, and you couldn't poke the eyes. Didn't say nothing about how you could wrap your hands. Didn't say you could wear shoes. You could wear anything that you normally trained in you can wear any, all, any and all of that. So there were no rules. So the idea was I was going to box somebody with cast on my hand. Wow. So if you got, so if I drew a striker, we're going to throw down with cast. So I was doing, I'd already been, we'd already been trained to do bag work without gloves on. I mean, I'm talking about legitimate, not just tap, tap, throwing punches and, and turn your punches over, uh, putting your hips behind your hooks and stuff like that on heavy bag. So we were taught to do that anyway. So that's not anything new. So, but being able to do that to flesh and bone is something different because now you can break you can break bones in your fingers and hands and things like that. So we had reinforced that. Now keep in mind, the Gracie has chaperones take us to where we want to do. And they saw me training that way and they put it on videotape. And when they had it on videotape and they took it back to Horian, next thing we know, the rules got changed the night before the night before the fight. Right. Wait a minute, Horian. There the, the poll, you got a poster right there that says there are no rules. Yeah. That's why, and, I, and so they, they changed the rules the night before. So that was our strategy. Now, if I had a fought against, that's what I was going to, if I fought against another striker, I was going to, that's, that was a strategy there. Protect yourself. Because at the end of the day, um, when you train for punishment, it's not that, it's not like it was, you got to remember who I was fighting against. Mm -hmm. I was, I, even though I was, a, I was, wasn't a representing kickboxing. That was uh, Gerard Gardot and Kevin Rozier. Um, they were more kickboxing guys. I was a karate guy. I was a right. world champion karate fighter, and I was the best karate. I was the best fighter in all of American Kempo Karate, which is the only American martial. Ed Parker's American Kempo Karate is the only American martial arts system known to Americans. You know, people say, "Oh, I study American Taekwondo." Nope, stop. The word Taekwondo takes it and puts it back into Korea. Oh, I study American Shotokan. Nope, stop. Does not, not it at all. So yeah. when you take your, so Ed Parker's Kempo Karate was the only American martial arts system. And I won the internationals by that time before times. And so I was representing karate. We had a different mindset. We had a karate mindset, which was a street fighting mindset. 
And in the street, there are no rules. So if we fought guy one, we wrap our hands this way. Round two, we do that. Kevin Rozier, I, I was thinking, you fight him. Because we didn't know how big Kevin was because Kevin wore a trench coat all week. So I didn't really know. I, I didn't really realize <laughs> Kevin was. I thought Kevin was supposed to be 260, 265. Yeah. Kevin was 365 pounds. <laughs> yeah. People don't look at If you look at me, I was 230, and I had to put on weight to fight that fight. So Kevin was two, uh, 365 pounds. He was 100 pounds heavier than what he was supposed to be. Right. So, um, but again, like I said, you couldn't see what he looked like because he wore a trench coat all week. To, to meetings, everything else, you know, we had uh, um, the media day, trench coat, trench coat. That's all he wore. He walked around trench coat and sunglasses. I couldn't see what he looked like. <laughs> so, so we didn't know who he was, but I had seen him fight. Go, oh, we can get this guy. Patrick Smith to me was another karate guy. Uh, we fought a bunch of those. Fought the best guys in the world, including Steve Nasty under Billy Blanks was one of the greatest camp. Those two guys were some of the uh, greatest camp karate champ. Alvin Prada, all those guys. So we knew what karate guys were going to do. We knew what it was going to do in a street fight because my 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 background as a bouncer and nightclub guy, and I won't say bouncer. We were we were more like you know. Uh, uh, tactical security officers in a place that was uh, had a lot of violence in it. So that was easy. So that was uh, the only thing that I didn't know was Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie. Art Jemison was another boxer. So I figured I was going to take him down and, 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 you know, knee on the chest kind of thing. And then same thing with Patrick, I'm going to take him down. So all the strikers I thought I was going to take down. Right. Because I had been already wrestling and grappling at that point anyway. The, yeah. the two mysteries were, the two mysteries was Ken Shamrock and Hoist. And I already knew how the Gracie's fight, you had to take them down first. You cannot let them take you down. Um, you cannot let them take you down. And then again, um, there's a slick little move I learned out of a movie called uh, They Live with Roddy Wright Piper and Keith David's in it. They have this alley scene that they fight. Well, I did this to a judo guy back in 1989. We got into a fight in, uh, in a dojo, because back then we had some dojo wars, trying to put me in what's called a guard now and try to arm bar me and choke me. But I used this gi pan, put this knee open, and then I just brought my knee up and struck the groin, pop, 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 pop. And then then climb on top of him, beat him up, and then got him what's called, you know, guillotine choke or what we call a, a rear naked choke now. Yep. So that's how you that's how you fight grapplers. So that's why I said I'm gonna take hoist down, pin him down, knee him in the groin. Because Grown was Grown was supposed to be a legal target, but again, Horian Gracie took that out the night before the fight. Can't no Grown shots because he watched me train that with other uh, uh, judo fighters at Mike Jones's studio. So he saw me training like that. And he goes, "Nah, that guy, no, that that guy, this guy is." And Horian Gracie, we well, got people forget. People forget. Horian Gracie was the one who chose me for UFC one. He Art David chose everybody else, but Horian chose me for UFC one. So he knew what I was, he knew what I could do as a fighter. He knew I could okay. fight. Yeah. So obviously UFC one was designed for Hoist Gracie to win. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I thought so. Yeah. I believe so. I believe so because one of the things that I asked, Jorge and Gracie said this, I never forget it. He says, hey, you guys are the greatest um, uh, fighters in the world right now. And um uh, you guys are uh, going to represent your UFC one. And I raised my hand. I says, well, we're in Denver, Colorado. I said, yeah. I said, well, Colorado Springs ain't too far from here. And last year was an Olympic year. I don't see no college wrestlers in here. I don't see no Olympic wrestlers in here. Right. I, 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 was, I pointed that out. I said, I always want see me. It was about testing my art and fi testing my skills and things. Say, if I lose, I know how to get better. If I win, how do I still get better? but at least you get a chance to test authentically test yourself. That's what I looked at UFC one was about testing yourself against another skilled fighter when there was no rules. Cause it goes back to when I was, when I got in a fight with a big football player, I got in a fight with a big football player at the time, a couple of them, you're talking about, you know, guys, some guys that are, you know, six, four, you know, back then 290 was big and guys moving pretty quick. So my reality is big muscular athletic for guys who can fight. Right. Who are also wrestlers, right? So my my whole idea was, uh, we got to find out, you know, wrestlers. Wrestlers was the thing. Wrestling, wrestling. That was always on my mind for years. Was wrestling. So I raised the question: How come there's no Olympic wrestlers in here? How come there's no guys? And he said, and Jorge and Gracie's quote to me: "Wrestling isn't a martial art." <laughs> Those are his exact words. Wow. And, yeah. 
And so my point with that is, is that we already knew that Hoist could not fight a wrestler because even if Hoist choked him out, to your point about fighting multiple people, Hoist doesn't get a chance to fight a second time. Right. Maybe Ken, maybe Ken Shadrock, maybe somebody else wins it. Maybe I win it. Maybe I don't. Somebody else wins it. But for certain, Hoist doesn't win it. Right. You know, because we, you say, well, how, how where did I get there? Look at UFC three. Look at what happened when he fought chemo. Yeah. Got tired when he fought. When somebody put him to the, put him to the test, put him to task, he couldn't come out a third time. No. Nope. Or wow. a second time. You know what I mean? So that's what we knew. That was a strategy is make Hoist fight more than one fight. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if he can fight. I know what it's like to fight more than one fight in the night. And I did that every night. It was a job every night. I know what that's like. But does he? And so, come to find out, they did know how to do that. And they we Hoist. And let me tell you something. Hoist was extremely well trained for UFC one. By the way, people don't know the training Hoist had to do for UFC one. When I found out later uh, what Hoist had to do to prepare for UFC one, um, you know. His family and my mom should get together because they had the same philosophy, man. You know, yeah. they, they, they were beating that kid up. They were beating him up every day. Wow. Well, too, and I mean, if it's his family that's planning the event, obviously they know it's going to happen. They kind of have an idea of when it's going to happen, you know, when the state, you know, it was ended up being uh, uh, held in Denver because Colorado allowed it to happen. Uh, but, you know, when you get start to, to know a, a time frame, and you can get more prepared rather than a guy, you know, maybe you find out yourself, you find out, you know, the, uh, a couple months ahead of time that the event's going to happen. You've got a, a few months, right? And that actually kind of leads into what I was going to ask you is how much time did you have to prepare for UFC 1? Well, remember, keep in mind, to, going back, I think, I believe that Hoist Gracie just didn't prepare for UFC 1 that night or two months or when they knew the event. I got videotapes going back watching Valley Tudo uh, uh, fights with Booster Monday, uh, Fabio Gugel, um, all of those Carlson Gracie guys. They were doing this for years. They've been doing this since the 1920s, 1930s. This is not anything new to those guys. They invented this with uh, the Valley Tudo type fighting, right? And so it just was new to Hoist. But his brothers, Hickson, have been fighting since 1980. Right. If you go back and look at Hickson's first fight against Zulu, that's 1980. So Hoist wasn't a stranger to this. Their family wasn't a stranger to this type of fighting. We as the world was stranger to this type of fighting because no sanctioning body would ever allow it. And you had a Hoist who had a fighting discipline that was designed to display this kind of fighting uh, skill and ability that we had never seen yet. We had never seen. Um, so now you may have seen in some of the movies, if you look back at some of the movies, James, James Cagney, I think it's something, a movie, uh, that he's fighting in, uh, I want to say tear in the sun or something like that. In 1945, he's fighting, you see judo and boxing, he's fighting in that movie and you see fighting and, and punching and striking with grappling. That was in 1945. So you kind of get an idea that I believe that they, ha they had an idea, which is, to your point, what they didn't know is who the fighters were going to be. And that was the part that they controlled. Right. That was the part they, that, that would have, they had, they had control over that, who was going to be in the show. Right. So and my point, I don't, I, it, it depends. So, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of depends on how, what your perspective is on, on what they prepared for it. Um, you know, I give them a lot of credit because Horian has been trying to do this since the eighties. Yeah, I'm trying to promote this show for the '80s, and so it was a good wake. It was a good wake-up call for all of us. Yeah, who were martial artists at the time. Real quick, Zane, uh, where did you get the nickname Nasty? That was that was your nickname, wasn't it? Yeah, it was my nickname. I was I asked permission to have that name from the original Nasty, which was Steve Nasty Anderson. So when I was in playing basketball in college, and I was doing tournament karate, and Nasty was the number one fighter. Nasty was probably the number one fighter for decades. Well, I would say decades, maybe two decades for sure. Um, all the way at least to 1987, 70s, all the way 1987. And there was an article that came out and was called Karate Illustrated Magazine it was for sport karate. And they said, and the article was titled, if you want to get to the top in sport karate, you have to get nasty first. 
So I chased Nasty Anderson around, tried to learn from him, train with him, did all sorts of martial arts with him, try to get him, try to work my way up to get to the tournaments. And back then you were seated. I remember going to the Battle of Atlanta and it was 30 guys in the black belt division alone, 30 guys. That means you fight at least six times that night. Okay, so you, and the thing about karate back then, you can use your best moves on guy number one, guy number two, but not everybody's seen your best stuff. If you ain't got, if you're a highly skilled, you don't get to, you don't, you don't get to the first place. Then you don't, you got to win first place. Then you got to win the other divisional champions. Then you get to fight the seated champion. Nasty only had to fight once because he was seated. So long short short, Nasty gets out to the internationals in California. He was banned from the Long Beach internationals because uh, Grandmaster Ed Parker banned him. But this was the year that the Budweiser team had came out and it was a big event. It was on national TV, um, 1987. So Nasty and I got a chance to fight. And um, I was fighting in one of the amateur divisions and I was using that as a warm up. I won the championship there. And that was called the Pro-Am division, which is where all the money was, which is where Nasty was. So I fought in that division. But, and I beat Nasty and I turned it into a street fight. And when I turned into a street fight, I beat Nasty. Uh, and, and that was, the, my goal is to beat Nasty. You know, if you want to get to the top, you got to beat Nasty. So I asked Nasty and we fought again in New York City, Madison, Madison Square Garden, uh, a team competition. And then Nasty was retired. And I called Steve on the phone. I think Steve lived in Canada at the time. And I asked him permission because he had legally changed his name to Nasty Anderson. And if you use that name in sport karate, he does have the right to, to, to seek legal action. So I said, Steve, I said, I always loved the name Nasty. And I told him the story about how I chased him for so long. He was honored about that. He said, I said, could I use the name Nasty? And he goes, you absolutely do. You can take the name Nasty because you beat Nasty. And so that was kind of the thing. And like I said, it wasn't just a, a, it was a street fight where punches, knees and elbows, ground and pound, all that shit. And we were fighting so bad that one of the, uh, Ron Chappelle, senior grandmaster Ron Chappelle disqualified me and Ed Parker had said let them fight because that's the number one guy in the world was nasty. So it was our Kempo guys versus the Budweiser guys and I was the best fighter at Kempo. I was just coming up at the time and so that's how I started to uh, make my name was I beat nasty that night and it was a packed crowd. It was a huge tournament that year that day and everybody saw that whole fight and that's kind of where it started from there. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in regards to the UFC, because you said you, you played basketball in college, so what was the transition like just in terms of, because I know that era of basketball when you played, it was a lot more nasty than it yeah. is, obviously. So I always yeah. get, I'm 42, so I always get these young guys, um, the Blues, because they want to tell me how LeBron James is the, is the coach, and he, he's a phenomenal a basketball player, let's make no mistake about it, but he ain't. <laughs> right. You, you ain't getting hand checked, bro. <laughs> you ain't getting hand checked. You ain't getting hand checked. You hey, know. hey, hey, that that's what I told him. I said my my, my OG from uh from my hometown, Gary Payton, a hand check you wear the glove and get your shit. Yeah. Yeah, I think LeBron James would have, because of his strength and size and ability, I think brought LeBron James himself would have made the transition because it was just a matter of being able to adjust because adjust to the physicality, he would have been able to do that because of the fact that he's physical already. It was just been to be able a small adjustment. But the transition for me, karate back then, everything was full contact. Basketball was full contact. I remember when I fought, we played the NCAA tournament and we played uh, University of Pittsburgh and we got to the Sweet 16. And it was a guy named Sam Clancy. Sam wound up going to the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think he did, but he played for the University of Pittsburgh. Now, Sam was about 6'7", and Sam was about maybe 275 and built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but could jump out the gym. Yeah. What I realized is that there's your conference play, and then there's the March Madness and uh, uh, the tournament play, and those are two different seasons, two different types of physicalities, and the referees let you play. I was already in that mindset because my father forced me to go to LA Mission and play basketball with a bunch of bums, which I thought were bums, they were bums, but literally they were ex-basketball players that played in college and pro, got into drugs and whatnot, and they were physical, they were so physical. My father had raised me up in that way, and when, frankly, when you, had, when you couldn't go there, uh, you, unless you went to the Mission and played first, which is what my dad told me, you couldn't go play at Venice Beach. 
because Venice Beach is where grown men play. The Joe Weekly Crenshaw League, that's where grown men play. So once I was able to play with these bums and get my physicality down 13, 14 years old, then I could go to Venice Beach and play. So the physicality was, was normal because that's just the way we all came up in that era. You had to yeah. be physical. So being physical on that and then fighting, it was just being, and I remember I was always kickboxing or boxing uh, as a kid, doing full contact karate as a kid. Cause remember everything was bare knuckle, get hit in the mouth and this stuff like that. All that was all legal. So physicality as a youth, and as a, in, in all sports, uh, that was something that I got used to. That was just something we did. I mean, when I played Pop Warner football, I'll never forget how I got to be starting a uh, wide receiver. Uh, coach had us sprint all the way down to the field. And uh, he says, okay, I'm gonna throw the ball up. Whoever catch it runs back. I caught it, ran all the way back. He says, good, go down to the field. All right, Zane, you stay down there. And then all of a sudden he throw the ball, I'm looking up at it and if you caught it, guys are running down there ta- trying to tell who can tackle you first. And you don't know the tackle's coming. And if you held on to the ball, oh, starting position. Starting position. So he did that to everybody. So what happens is you got learned. You got the Oklahoma drill was my favorite thing as growing up as a little kid. I mean, we grew up on the Oakland Raiders, Jack, Jack Tatum and George Atkinson. Come on. That's a that's that that was standard. We were trying to play like that. Yeah. Yeah, we that was that's how we have played in the front yard. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so contact was and, and and physicality was normal for me. Yeah, I, I I was having a conversation the other day with some guys, and I said, uh, matter of fact, I did a podcast yesterday with some of my former teammates, and uh, the the question was posed: What do you think is 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 a little different with this era? Because I coach junior college football, and I and I train and mentor young athletes. And I said, I think the difference is we just have – and he is just real soft with the with the um, participation trophy mentality. And you know, the standard and the expectation so set so low now that I don't uh, – you know, participation across the country has dropped significantly in regards to all sports because, you know, back when we – the newspaper, our athletes, something to brag about. Now they don't care about it. Well, two things I think happened in that generation which was responsible. One, my generation was responsible for the participation, and here's why. And I was telling Ryan this. When I got into, ran from a kid, a white kid who was calling me the N-word at school. My, I finally went to Hawthorne, uh, school in Hawthorne, and um, because all the other schools kicked me out for fighting. Because back then, if you punched a kid, you got suspended. But if you kicked a kid, you got expelled. So because I knew karate, I was punching. I was doing my Jim Kelly back fist, reverse punch, side kick, kicking people in the face. They, they, you got kicked out of the school district for that. You can't kick nobody in school back then in the seventies. That was that was considered violent if you kicking the school. That means you were some kind of disabled kid or something like that, right? You had some mental disorders. What they said. So a school finally took me. And long story short, this white we were the only, but I was only one or two families that lived on the block and I was only one of two kids that were black kids in the whole school running home. My mom catches me running home from a fight comes, it happens to come out the time I'm running. I'm, I'm like five steps from the door. I get in. She won't know. She won't nothing the wiser. And this kid, he's bigger than me. My mom happens to come out and catch me. goes in the house, gets her extension cord and comes down to the kid's house, knock on the door and your son is chasing my son. Come out here and let him fight. And my mother told me, if you take one step back every time oh. you do, I'm a, I'm a, and she had an extension cord and she tore my legs up, boy. And I had to stand plant. You had to go forward or stand your feet, stand your ground and plant your feet and throw. My point with that is, is that we grew up at that generation and we said that even though we came up like that, we weren't going to let the next generation come up like that because even though that was good for us, and that's how standard we were. Mama, mama and daddy might have been wrong, you know, uh, yeah. because so so we changed that. And so we made it about having fun, making participation. Everybody get the chance to try out for the team and stuff like that. And we didn't know that that was going to produce what it produced. We thought it was just going to be more inclusive in that environment. Second, kids stopped weight training and stopped really being tough because everything we did at a, at a school 
was was, was about toughness. Like I was telling my, one of my members about, they asked me the same thing about fighting and violence. I said, well, when I was in school, my principal told you, you got a problem, go take, go to sandbox. So you go to the sandbox at the school and you one, you step one foot in, you can't step one, you got to put both feet in. So if you said, so, 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 and so, uh, 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 I got a problem with you, you stepped in the sandbox. And if you didn't step in the sandbox, we knew you were chicken. So sandbox where you can't kick, you can't do nothing else, and you got to fight in the sandbox. And the principal sat there and let you go. That was standard, and I went to a wealthy school. That was, that was 1967 standard. We play games like suicide. I don't know if you played suicide. Well, you can't remember. You ever play a game called suicide? He played where, like, I don't know. It's different terms for different different eras and different areas. So, like, I guess I think I know what you're talking about. Like, throw it up, tackle. We had a get. That's basically suicide. We will have like 10, 15, 20 dudes, and it's one ball, one yeah. football, uh, tennis ball, whatever we could use, and throw it up, tackle. So. One guy, we throw the ball up, somebody catch it, and then he got a score. But it's one one dude against everybody. All right, that's one version of suicide. So the other, that? yeah, that's that's one version of suicide. The suicide we played was we were in a racquetball court, and you either had one of those little balls you get out of a gumball machine, okay, or you had a tennis ball or a racquetball, mm -hmm. and you throw up against the wall, and if the ball hits you. You got beat up, pop, pop, pop. And oh, you gotta, get, you gotta get to the wall and touch. You gotta go to the wall and touch it. Wow. And if you got to the wall and touch it, right, then you got a chance to throw the ball. So the thing was, wasn't staying back behind the line. It was who's gonna step up and try to catch it, because that meant that you was you weren't scared to get beat up. So that's one thing. Now, when you talk about game banging, it was a different thing that, that was called called a T line and how our crew was doing it. Uh, based on Tookie Way or late Stanley Tookie Williams. And I used to know Tookie Way back when I was a kid. My, a lot of my family members doing it was called a T-line. You didn't get jumped in when you had to join the game. You didn't get jumped in. That came later. That came in the 80s. That, that's, that, that came much, much later. What you had to do was walk the T-line. And that means you had to walk the line and a guy get to punch you, kick you, but you had to stand there and take it. And you couldn't let your back hit the ground. That was called getting your back dirty. If you got your back dirty, had to start all over again. You only got three tries. And then once you walk the T line, which is the linear line, then you had to walk it from left to right because left was East Coast, because West Coast, and right to East Coast because that's where the other other side crips come from. So Stanley was from the the West Side uh, LA. So you walked it from left to right because by that time Raymond Washington would already have been killed already. So by that time, he was other founder, him and a guy named uh, Jamel, I forget Jill's last name, but Jamel, Tukey, and Raymond Washington all started the groups together. So that's kind of how you got jumped in and you had to walk from left to right and the, le and the left to right guys were the toughest guys and you had to take a shot in the face and you had to walk across and, there, and you, you, you basically uh, uh, bit your mouth down so you couldn't get your teeth, uh, get your teeth knocked out. But if you got your tooth knocked out, that was it. You got hit on the chin and you went to sleep. You still wake, started up and started again. So that's how we that's how we grew up. So, and the reason for that was if somebody said, hey, what's up, cuz? You say, what's up, cuz? But they happened to be a blood, then they fired on you on Friday night. You got to be able to fire back. Yeah. So that's how that all got started. So you got to be able to fire back. So when we talk about violence and fighting, man, that was a game we played every day. We, we played those games every day. So that's just B.B. Britches. You remember B.B. Britches? Yep. We, that's see, how we play. But see, and I, and I get that and I identify with that. Being from Northern California, we didn't gang bang. We, we had turf. So, you know, similar format, but just, you know, it wasn't about no colors. Um, well, that's, so why I, I told, that's why I told Ryan. That's why I told Ryan, turning around. But that's why I told Ryan earlier, is that the gangs in the 80s, in the 70s, were different than the gangs in the eighties, by the time the crack got into the neighborhood, that's a different, that's a different genre of gangs. Ours was about turf like it was in the early days because you gotta keep in mind, I tell people all the time, there's this movie out or documentary that Bones and those guys, Cleve Bones and guys made called Bastards of the Party. You gotta check that out because it shows you that my parents, my dad was from West Oakland. He lived in Harbor Hole. He lived in Harbor Homes. So, okay. yeah, so my dad was from, and my, my family they're from Harbor Homes up in West Oakland. So what happened is, Huey P. Newton, all them guys were running 
they were little kids and my dad and his crew was running everything. So a lot of the, the Black Panther stuff came to, when they came to LA, that's how they taught us to have to fight the system was to take care of our neighborhood and right. Crip meant community. My mom taught me commitment. Crip meant community, revolution, and progress. That's what it stood for. So that's what we were. We're neighborhood watch. We're not going to let anybody come in and steal Mrs. Jones' car. You know, somebody from another neighborhood coming and robbing and stealing stuff like that. No, we weren't going to do that. We weren't going to let you do that. So we protected our neighborhood, just like you guys did up in that's that's where it comes from up in the the turf situation because it was um, it was a it was a Northern California concept really uh, from the Black Panther Party. Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. That's 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 deep right there. Yeah. So, so you got root, and I and I I explain to people that's not that aren't from California too, like. Man, y'all don't understand. It's like five, four, four or five different states in this one state. That's how big it is. Yeah. So it's just so different. But yeah, you know, growing up in the, um, me and Ryan touched on this before too. We talked about um, me personally. I, I figured out because my, my my BA is sociology, and then I got my master's in strength and conditioning. Right. So I, I was thinking one day, I was like, yo, a lot of a lot of us that's from the inner city, we got PTSD. Yeah, we seeing stuff as a kid that no kids should ever see or hear, and we normalize it because that's what's going on in the neighborhood. And then by the time we 25, 30, 35, 40 years old, something happens, and then we we finally figure it out. Like yo, like you said earlier, maybe I was wrong, uh, raised wrong. Our yeah. parents didn't know no better. They didn't know no better. That's why the, that's why UFC one was normal to me. Yeah, UFC one was normal. Everybody keeps thinking there's some grander. To me, it was normal. It was just, that's how we always fought. All the karate studios, we always fought. I mean, there were literally dojo wars where in, in, the, in the early 80s, late 80s, every karate studio you go to had their own fight night. Yeah. They had their own fight night. If I wanted to go spar and fight with other studios, and they, we ain't talking sparring. We're talking straight out fighting with gloves on and stuff like that. And I wanted to go, there was a place you go on Monday night. It was big with John Robinson's on Monday night. Um, then you go to the BKF on Tuesday night. Then you go uh, Wednesday night with Steve Fisher. Thursday night was back at Sherman Oaks Karate. Friday was the Kaja Kempo. Saturday was, at morning was Benny the Jet. You're, since they Benny the Jet, your kids in the studio. We had tournaments on Saturday and Sundays. And then you turn around and do that till on Monday. So fighting was always something we always did from a street perspective. In the late in the early 90s, karate really got commercialized like health club centers, and a lot of that went away, which is why the Gracies were able to come in at the time and be able to say that karate system doesn't work, that karate system doesn't work, that karate system doesn't work. I was watching a video by karate by Jesse, and Jesse makes this very interesting point, and I agree with him. Uh, he said there's three generations of karate. He's right about that. The first version of karate a martial arts, if you will, was the street fighting self-defense. That really worked in the street. Second was the meditative part, which is your yoga, your stretching, you're getting the character building traits of it. And the third generation was sport karate. If you take martial arts out of any one of those generations, out of context, it doesn't work. For example, if you take the first generation and put it into the third generation, which is the street fighting, or you take the street fighting organization, uh, uh, generation, first generation, which, and put it into the third generation with the sport fighting, it doesn't work. If you put the middle generation, which is the meditative part of it, into the first generation, karate doesn't work. And if you take the, the uh, third generation and put it into the middle generation, it doesn't work because it wasn't meant to be. So I heard Jesse say that, and he's so right about that because I experienced all three of those generations coming up in California, different studios were training in different generations. So when the Gracies came and brought in UFC, um, UFC one, they picked the generation that they knew was the weakest of the generations, which was the middle generation. That's how they were able to pick their fighters out of that generation. You say, how do we know that? Zane, you, Zane, you're talking about this and that. Prove it. Well, here we go. Go back to UFC two. And that's the, that's the generation where you see all the Kung Fu masters, karate master, Ping Jakes a lot, Jitsu, all them cats come out. After UFC 2, they never came back out. There you go. Middle yeah. generation. 
middle generation. You don't see this third generation. There's, there's a fourth generation now, which is your karate fighters that have been trained in all three generations and who are now adding the grappling and wrestling component to it now are seeing those guys compete in the UFC. That's what it always should have been from the beginning. And there's a character building trait in the competition portion of it because you treat it like a professional sport now. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where you see it. So that's what the Gracies did were they came in at the right place at the right time to start this event. And they picked the right generation of martial artists to do it. And that is that that's that meditative generation guys who thought they were good guys who thought they could fight guys who had good black had great skills, but have never put their skills to the test. They didn't get into martial arts for that. And when the challenge were, was posed to them by the Gracies, they, they all they all didn't they, they weren't successful in that. That's why, because they were they were they they were training out of the wrong generation. And then when the great when the when the first generation came to the Gracies and wanted to fight, Gracies wanted no part of that. They wanted no part. Of that. How do we know that? I'm from that that generation, and you change your rules the night before the fight. Wow. How you gonna change your rules? How you gonna tell us there's no rules? And you come up and tell us there is rules. And then they and what they did was Horian tried to punk me. Well, Horian said to him, he goes, he said something like, and this is there's an article that came out in magazine, but USC one that documents all of this. So Horian Gracie says to me, Oh, Zane, what's the matter? You can't fight because you need your raps. Are you gonna be able to get need your raps when you get in the street? I said, No, Horian. Usually if you came to me in the street and uh 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 and we were gonna get into it, the first thing I go, I go to the art of ching ching pow. And that means I clack, clack, boom, boom, boom. I bust you up with my nine millimeter. They may not beat you up. I said, so I said, that's, that's the art of ching, ching, pow. Uh, I said, so, so, so that's a different martial arts system, but, that's the, but you don't know nothing about that in Brazil. And so everybody started laughing. And I said, well, you know what? If you're going to change the rules, Hor Horian, guess what? We might as well fight right now. And I pulled the table aside, put the table, we can go to it. We can get to it right now. Me here, me and you right here, right now. I'll fight your punk ass brother first. And that's kind of how it started everything. That's why I kind of see why I wasn't the UFC too. Wow. You know? So so you got to keep in mind, I was kind of, like I said, I was that guy that had that mentality, but had that skills that nobody wanted to fight. Yeah. So, so, so anyway. That, 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 that's interesting. So it was like orchestrated and, and picked so they could be successful then. Not only that, that fighters, people, um, people don't know this, Hoya, the Gracies wanted videotape of everybody who was in UFC one, so Hoyce can study that how you fought. They know they knew they knew. You go back and look at the tape, study the tape. Hoyce Gracie actually takes Ken Shamrock down. Yeah. You gotta look at you gotta study this guy. Hoyce act and, and that's a and that's a great shot that Ken uh, uh, Hoyce shoots too. And then it's fast and he gets low. Why? Because he knows that Ken is going to come up and he's going to try to go ankle lock, right? So mm -hmm. if, if Ken takes Hoist down, which Ken had the ability to take Hoist down, Ken was going to put him in the ankle lock. And you got to remember, ankle locks and the hill hooks and leg bars were banned in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They were never taught in Brazilian, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. The Gracies knew that. So Hoist shoots on Ken first, makes him makes it a wrestler. Ken doesn't, it's not, he doesn't react fast enough. Hoist gets to the side and chokes him out. Boom, rap, fights a rap. People forget that. So why? Because they knew how Ken was going to fight. They had videotape of him. They had videotape of Art. Everybody, the only one they had videotape was me because a friend of ours was, hey, Zane, the Gracie's, uh, I forget her name now. Her name was Stacy something. And she was collecting videotapes and she was trying to get videotapes from, um, of me fighting. So Bernie Krasno, one of the great karate coaches of all time, they had the first national karate team. He just passed away. Bernie Krasno has videotape on all the karate fighters. So the Gracies came and asked Bernie for tapes on me, and Bernie told him no. And Bernie called me and said, hey, Zane, the Gracies are looking for tape on you, just so you know that. So we didn't give him any tape. That's why they were at the trade show watching me fight before UFC won when I got in a fight with Frank Dukes. That's why they were there. They wanted to see me fight. So what happened was Horian already said, you got to go see this guy fight. So when Frank Dukes and I got into the street fight at the Draka show, Art, Davey, Art Davies and uh, Hoist was there and they saw me body slam Frank and beat him up, basically ground and pound. And they said, hey, 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 you're in the UFC. That's how I, that's why they were there. 
Right. Because I was I was fighting for a world Draka world championship that night, which Draka is a is a kickboxing shoot boxing version mm -hmm. of um for for the Russian. You know, there's everybody right. forget this shoot wrestling, shoot boxing, shoot wrestling. Draka is their version of shoot boxing, punching, kicking, and throws. So I was fighting for a world title that night. That's why they were there. Oh. Zane, I, I was going to ask you about Frank Dukes. And obviously, everybody that knows Frank Dukes knows that the movie Bloodsport was, you know, loosely based on Frank Dukes. What do you know about Frank Dukes in the whole Bloodsport movie? And Well, here's what I can tell you. So I'm, 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 I'm tired of bodyguard work. I'm tired of getting shot at for a living. Billy Blanks. And I finally decide, I finally make a, 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 it was actually a spiritual decision, me and God, that I was going to fight full time. So I go to Billy Blanks and I said, Billy, can you sponsor me? I want to, I want to fight full time. And Billy goes, yes. So I quit the bodyguard work. Um, had some money saved in the bank so I could train for a while. So Billy calls me and says, hey, man, this guy named Frank Dukes just fired another friend of mine named Satch Williams, uh, the late Satch Williams, great karate champion himself. He was from the Bay Area. Satch, he had, uh, and Frank Dukes had a falling out. So Frank Dukes had just fired Satch. He said, hey, man, Frank Dukes is looking for somebody to run his studio. I said, hey, man, I'll go over there. And so Frank Dukes hired me to run his studio. So I built it. He had only 10 students because Satch took all, all the students. He didn't stay. Satch didn't take them. All the students left to be with Satch because Frank Dukes never taught any of his, all those classes. So I built it up from like 10 students to about 110 students in a small, like six, 700, maybe 800 square foot studio. And then Frank did the same thing to me. So what I did was, is I opened up my own studio, took the students, followed me right up the street, and we became extremely successful. And a lot of students came up there. Frank Dukes hired somebody to kill my wife and I in Belgium. What? Yes. So this is how this is, a, and LAPD has a record of this, by the way. We filed a complaint with the LAPD, uh, LA County Sheriff Department, and the LAPD in turn filed a complaint with the FBI because of the fact that this occurred uh, overseas. It became an international uh, crime and the FBI got involved, okay? So uh, some of his students came to my studio and said, Frank Dukes had hired some people to kill you and your wife. So we, we, I thought they were just trying to stir things up between me and Frank. So I asked them to come down to the LAPD and to file a complaint. And we went down to Parker Center and they filed a complaint. So they sent LA County Sheriff looking for Frank Dukes and the FBI was notified. And I was told that if I saw Frank Dukes on site or something like that, he would attack me. I had a right to uh, defend myself. Let's just put it that way. Wow. So, um, so that's this is this goes because this winds up in this winds up in a courtroom. By the way, I don't know. You can pull the court record transcripts. You can see the record. Matter of fact, I can show you the 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 whole part of the the lawsuit because I got sued for twenty million dollars. Frank sued me for twenty million. Obviously, I didn't have twenty million, but he sued me for twenty million. So, but here's what I can tell you: Frank Dukes is not a slouch. Let me make this clear. Frank Dukes ain't a slouch. He just ain't what the movie said he was. You go look at your good Muay Thai, kickboxing, judo, black belt, karate guy. Frank Dukes is that guy. Yeah. But he ain't what the Bloodsport movie was, breaking bricks and all that other stuff with his mind and all that stuff. He ain't that dude. He ain't that dude. But he is a def he is definitely a competent martial arts and fight fighter. He can fight. I mean, even though, I mean, that was just it. I mean, um, Frank could fight, but, um, you know, he's not, he's not the, what the movie is. So that's part of, you know, this, that's part of what you know about Frank Dukes, uh, that he can fight. Great storyteller, fantastic storyteller. Um, uh, Bloodsport was a great story. Um, he had a couple other movies that were Kickboxer, Tong Po. That was a great story. And there was one other yeah. he did with Roger Moore. That's those are great stories. So Frank is an is a fantastic storyteller and he's believable. Yeah. But he but but he ain't that guy that the movie said he was. That he's not the guy that Van Damme was. So that's kind of how I tell you about Frank. And so that's kind of how that started uh, with he and I. And so it essentially happened uh, after hey, the session. Quick we got, question. Uh huh. So. So I'm I, I got a question about Billy Blanks. Is Billy okay. Blanks really that guy? Oh yeah. Well, so let, so let me tell you about Billy. If you ever seen the movie The Last Boy Scout, anybody see that movie The Last Boy Scout? Yeah. You watch Billy Blanks in that scene? Yes. See how athletic he is? 
Yeah. Billy Blanks was the greatest at karate athlete of our time. Everything we, everything that Bruce Lee did as an athlete and a karate fighter, Billy Blanks put into action. Okay, now Billy wasn't a kickboxer or Muay Thai guy. He was a great karate fighter and Billy could flat out fight. A lot of drills and training stuff that I do today and I train my kids come from Billy Blanks. It's unfortunate that people, so Billy and I had a goal. So when Billy and I got hooked up, I was chasing Billy on the circuit and Billy was a light heavyweight champion and Nasty Anderson was a heavyweight. So I was spar with Billy because Billy had greater skills than Nasty and was faster than Nasty, but Nasty was fast and he was big. Nasty was like 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 you know, 240. And we never, they, karate had never seen a heavyweight that big before and could move that fast. So I would spar and train with Billy because Billy was always gracious with up and coming guys. Hey man, I'm up and coming. And because Billy's eight, nine years older than me. So I was a kid coming up. So Billy would train and Billy, we would do training drills where we do thousand kicks in class and Billy would count every last one of them. So his training process and training protocol is phenomenal. Matter of fact, he trained Sugar Ray Leonard for a couple of his fights. And if you talk to Sugar Ray Leonard, he'll tell you Billy Blanks can train. Uh, and he's great. So, but when it came to the contact and the full contact, Billy, that's where Billy didn't get, do, didn't do very well. When it came to kickboxing, Muay Thai and stuff like that. Now, can he kickbox and box and Muay Thai? Yeah. But for some reason, that generation where the 70s and, and, and uh, in the eight, early 80s, Billy just never fought full contact karate. And the reason, and, and he just didn't, because if you look at the PKA, he fights on a bunch of the cards for karate tournaments, but you never see him fight uh, in kickboxing. That's why I say Alvin Prader from the BKF, the black karate fighter, is the greatest karate fighter of all time. Because Alvin was not only a boxing champion, uh, he was starting his bo a phenomenal boxing career. He was a kickboxing champion, which is low kicks, punches, full contact karate champion, and a world karate champion. And here's what made Alvin special. I, well, I In those nightclubs, I fought with Alvin side by side in a street fight against multiple guys, strength, crips, bloods, whatever it might be coming at us. And Alvin fought in the street the same way he fought full contact karate, the way, same way he fought kickboxing, the same way he boxed, and the same way he sparred in the JoJo. It was exactly the same system. He fought the way, and it was trans. You couldn't tell what he was doing when he was doing it. And so before he was gunshot in 1985, that was when he was at his best. There was nobody better. Billy Blanks and Nasty never made it to full contact or kickboxing. So that's why Billy falls short in that category. He just never did. I know Michael. Michael was Michael used, to come, Michael used to come down to the BKF, good karate guy. He was not, he, he fought in a couple of tournaments and things like that. Michael's got a lot of skill. I've loved watching this movie because Mike is slick. Um uh, he does a lot of good stuff. I, I like to, he represents what it should look like when you do real karate stuff right. You know what I mean? I mean, Mike fight scenes is based on actually being able to fight in martial arts for real. So uh, he used to come down and train. He trained with Leo Greer from the BK for a while. They used to spar a while. And Mike was good, but, you know, he wasn't one of us. He wasn't, he didn't compete at that level. He was a movie guy. And he, I remember meeting Mike and he was going in that direction. I want to say he might be from Ohio. I'm not sure where Mike was from, but we met a couple of times uh, in the early 90s. And that's when they were making all those great karate movies, you know, um, I won't say great, but they're B-rated. When I say great, guys were getting paid on them. And Michael said he was going to go in that direction because you got to keep in mind, the time that Mike came out, there was no, there was no money in fighting. Yeah. So Mike was making money. Him and Billy started making all the movies. They guys were making money, handle proficient in movies, while the rest of us knuckleheads was trying to be champions and fight and, and become, you know, you know, the you know, world champions and stuff like that. So, um, but there was no broke. We could, we were always broke. Them guys were, them guys were driving BMWs and stuff like that, and we were. We were out there, you know, struggling to make ends meet because we had a martial arts studio and we'd do okay, but you weren't making money like Michael and them guys were. So Mike is good. I like Mike. I love I love watching him fight because when I see when I see Michael do a fight scene, I know where he got that move from 
oh, I know what he's trying to say. Everybody else may look at something exterior and see it, but I look at beneath what Mike is doing. I say, like, for example, when he's fighting Kimbo Slice in the bathroom, right? Uh, and in the, in, the, in the prison scene, I've seen Alvin Prouder do that same move. So I say, I laugh at that because I, I was there when Alvin did it in the street fight. And I crack up and I say, that's funny because I know exactly where that move come from. So Mike does stuff that I enjoy a lot of times because I know where his where his heart is and his mind is, and it comes from an authentic place. Yeah. So, Zane, what are your thoughts on uh, Chuck Norris? Uh, I took my first karate class from Chuck Norris. People don't know why Chuck Norris is famous in karate. Chuck Norris is famous in karate because he introduced the spinning back kick in karate tournament competition. Not even the Japanese and Koreans were doing that. The other thing with Chuck Norris is Chuck Norris produces some of the greatest black belts that you'll ever see. I mean, when I lost the Worlds in Seattle, I lost to his top black belt, Chip Wright, who doubled for Emma Walker, Texas Ranger. I used to see Chip when I came back from, I saw Chip, Chip Wright coming back from um, Brazil one time and, and we had to go through Dallas. And uh, he and I fought, and, and I hit him with a good back fist that was kind of like a jab back fist and side king. We had a great, and I lost him like four to two or something like that. And he just, I was up and coming for the world, for the overall world. I won the heavyweight world. He won the lightweight world. And we ran into each other in and, and Dallas, Texas, and we hugged and exchanged pleasantries and things like that. And I said, hey, Chip, my ribs still hurt because he caught me in a side kick so bad that I thought, all of my ribs were broken. And it was just it was, a, it was it was just a beautiful quick kick. And I had never been kicked that hard with such ease. And then he had said to me, Yeah, my eye still hurts too. And so we laughed and joke about that. So Chuck Norris has the greatest, and I will say the greatest, uh, karate system. When I mean karate system, that it produces skills in their students better than anyone you've ever seen. I mean, if you look at his system. Um, I, Rick Prieto was a guy that I was training with to buy one. I was going to buy, I was trying to buy Rick Prieto school, uh, when I was looking to get into martial arts business and his school was available in studio city. And he was going to, uh, leave, uh, to go to Texas because, uh, Chuck Norris's, um, Chuck Norris's, uh, um, Walker, Texas Britain had got approved. So he was going to help Chuck Norris, you know, stunt cargo for that kind of thing. So he was selling the business. He was going to move to Texas. And so I had to go through the Chuck Norris system to be able to teach the Chuck Norris system, which I didn't want to do, but he had to do that if you're going to take over the business. As I went through the system, I found it so fascinating on how they were, Chuck Norris put together his system. It was beautifully put together. And when you look at all of his students, the UF um, uh, students, Chuck Norris, man, you go on, you go to Chuck Norris's tournaments, man. You got to, there's a whole lot of guys in there that you got to fight that are tough, tough guys. They can box, they can kickbox, they can uh, point fight. They got good kicks, they got good punching skills, they got great timing. Um, then he added jujitsu at one of the belts levels and blue belt, I think it is Brazilian jujitsu. Uh, he was the first to do that and make that a, a, a requirement back in 1988, 89, and then. Uh, Muay Thai, so it's a it's one of the most complete systems out there. Yeah. So I'm a at, fan. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm a fan of Chuck Norris. At the time, did you think that there was going to be another UFC after UFC one? No, they said there was never going to be. A, yeah, they said they said no. They said it was never going to be another UFC one because Gold's Gym. I'll never forget it. Pete Jimkowski and all those guys who was the sponsor of UFC one were appalled at UFC one. And they said, there'll never be another UFC one. Mm -hmm. Back then, Senator McCain had started to step in and make comments that they will never allow this event to happen again. So we thought that this was it. You know, Jim Brown even said, he goes, man, that stuff y'all pulled in there today. He goes, he goes, uh, uh, cause when Taylor Tooley would, um, got cut like that, people don't realize that that referee got, the reason why he got fired is that he was not supposed to stop that fight. Taylor didn't tap. Right. He did not tap. The fight was supposed to go on. Like in my fight, I didn't tap. My wife threw in the towel because I had an asthma attack in the ring. 
in the cage in UFC one. So I didn't tap. We weren't going to tap. Nobody, you know, you weren't unless. And I can understand why Patrick Smith had to tap simply because of the fact um, that Ken, Ken is the kind of guy, if you don't tap, he, I train with Ken and Sharon. He tell you, you don't tap, he'll break it. Yeah. That's just Ken. That's just Ken. Um, he'll break it if you don't tap. And Gerard Gardeau, if you look at that choke that Hoist put on, that's a different, that, that wasn't a rear naked choke as we know it today. Go back and look at that choke on Gerard Gardeau. That's a different choke. There are different rear naked chokes. There's a the restraint where you tap out and there's one that if you don't tap, that's going to, that's going to break your trachea. Right. And that's why he panicked like he did because that was, that choke is a different choke. And that, that choke was tight. So either that he, you know, you know, so he tapped, but then he bit hoist too. So that's why hoist did that to him. So, <laughs> yeah, <he did>. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, um, those are, those are that, that we didn't think there was going to be another, we saw, and we all, and yours for the first time, we all, for the first time I can remember, and that was a more of a traditional martial arts came around the traditional guys, myself, Ken Shamrock, Hoist even, for a little while, Art Jimison, um, uh, Patrick Smith, um, Kevin Rozier, we all sat back, there, sat back there, sat around the table and says, we gotta go train with each other. Yeah. Because remember, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was basically discipline versus discipline. That's how that was presented, right? And so, we didn't really have permission per se to go train with another discipline. Although Kempo at the time, depending on who you train with, was inclusive. But could I go condition with Ken Shamrock? Could I go, can I go condition? Could I go condition? Uh, could I go condition with, um, can I go condition with um, uh, uh, Hoy or do Jiu Jitsu with Hoist at the time? So um, we all got a chance to realize we got to go train with each other because this, we knew in our heart, we hoped it evolved and here's why. For the very first time, we now had a professional sport that was, we hoped that it would get to the NFL or NBA or Major League Baseball or hockey level. We hoped that it because it was time for us to put martial arts on, this, on a, on a um, level that was competitive with other sports. That was my whole reason why I didn't when I, I didn't care about when I fought for my and it was called back then it was called workouts because my dad was friends with Paul Silas who was a coach of the New Jersey Nets at the time. That's how I got my workouts and now they call them workouts. Back then it was called tryouts, and I I fought for world title the night before, and my 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 workout or tryout and then um, and they had some scouts come out and stuff like that for the team and came it was West Coast tryout and so what essentially happened is. Um, I didn't really care about it that much because I won the title that night and I got a hundred bucks and my, and a league minimum at the time was $163,000. So my dad was telling me, you can get in the NBA, you can do this. I said, dad, I didn't care about that. So I fought for that, for, uh, that night before and went to try out with the basketball and basketball didn't have that kind of appeal anymore. Cause I was hoping, man, this has got to blow up. Kickboxing's got to grow, blow up, cause kickboxing was supposed to. So when the kickboxing didn't blow out, and UFC came around, it was our hope that it would blow up, be something bigger, so we could finally tell the American public to respect martial arts. Cause you got to remember, the American people didn't respect martial arts. Because why the the nineties, the the eighties, late eighties and nineties were full of ninja movies. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> That, that was playing. I was playing at the movie theater. You got a ninja crawling up a L.A. city wall, broad daylight in a black garb, killing people. And where's the LAPD? You mean the LAPD? Oh, come on, LAPD ain't gonna let that happen. Stop it, you know. But that's what you told the American public, and the American public lost respect in martial arts. So then, kickboxer comes out, or excuse me, then um, Bloodsport comes out. Yeah. Then, then next year, a couple years later, then you get Tong Po come out. But now you keep in mind, Bloodsport came out in 88. By the time it runs its course, then the UFC comes out. Right. And so you had all these other, you had all these other action movies that were B-rated movies. But for the most part, the American public, both from a fitness standpoint and from a, 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 a fitness workout training standpoint, or as a uh, uh, respect for self-defense, they didn't respect it. The American public consumer didn't respect martial arts at that time. 
So it was our hope that if this was to shock people and make people stand up, we were now going to say, you got to respect martial arts. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. What you did. Yeah, definitely did. Um, so after UFC one, you returned to uh, the World Kickboxing Federation with a record of 17 and 0. And you ended up making your debut in the K1 in 96. Uh, what was fighting in K1 like? It was great because I had this one fight. So back then I had, I've never had a manager. You know, that's the whole thing. I've never had a manager. I've always said, hey man, same place you want to fight. That's always it. And I always had to get in shape, get a fight. I never had a team or a camp. I don't even know what a camp is like. I've never had a camp. I've always had to do my own training, do my own conditioning, do that thing like that. So I was training and I had fought in some, for the, um, uh, some local shows and it was and the UFC was the one that started keep in mind that when UFC one came out comes out the K1 with Ernesto Hoos, Jerome LeBanner, Andy Hogg, all those guys that came out at the same time that was going to Japan at the same time so when they were looking for fighters because of me being UFC one and throwing one kick in UFC one Mr. Ishii asked me to come to fight in UFC uh, in the K1 now you gotta keep in mind this I was not allowed to fight in any other shows um, because of the fact that the UFC supposedly they claim on you. So by the time I didn't get UFC two, which I was supposed to be a UFC two, and because uh, um, my fight was the best fight of the night, according to our Dave and Horry and Gracie, I was supposed to be in UFC two. Uh, but there's a story behind that because um, um, Art Davy had told me that the Gracies didn't want to fight you in UFC too. So I have to switch now from not being able to go to the UFC anymore, or for a while at least, to go to the K1. Okay. So now I got to go to the K1 because I can't get in the UFC and MMA fights are far and few between and you can't get them. Nobody's trying to do it. Everybody's trying to do it underground. Everybody was trying to do it. Uh, what's the guy named Buddy Alvin was having fights. We were fighting in parking garages for a thousand bucks and all kind of crazy nonsense. People were having fights like that. This guy was having some fights underground. Mexico, they were having fights. So we, were, so the only way to get a, uh, to reestablish your career on the on a on a what we call now platform was either UFC K1 because that's where it was that was where the action was happening. So I got a chance to fight on that show, and and so I had trained with uh, a lot of guys, and so I had heard about Peter Erickson. Jerome LeBanner and Nestor who's I knew Stan Demand Laundry, all those guys. So um, it was great because I had we were there for seven days and I got a chance to spar with every last one of those guys to see how you measure up. So I was like, man, okay, this is gonna be cool. But again, not having any management, um, I only you only got a handful of shows at that time. So, but it was great. It was a great event. It was like that's an event to let you know that you are a pro fighter, that you are part of a fraternity that was special because, in my opinion, that was the greatest. Uh, heavyweight uh, class of assemble of fighters in that, that period of K1 that we've ever seen so far. I mean, uh, you did, I mean that generation of kickboxing was just the heavyweight kickboxing was different. Everybody was a world champion from their country. Everybody was good. Yeah. And so um, that was good. That was that was a great experience. Yeah. Grateful for the opportunity. So Zen, we're getting close to the end of our show with you. Couple uh, couple questions left over. Talk to us a bit about your uh, fight in UFC 996 with Cal Warsham. Oh, wow. Talk to us a bit about that fight. Oh, that's a sensitive fight. That's a sensitive subject to me because because a couple of reasons why I had, I had some guilt in that fight, you know. Um, so I'm ready now. I've been training wrestling, grappling, as so as I think, right? And so I'm ready to fight. And... Uh, so as I thought, right, I mean, I got somebody to teach me Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu so I could somewhat go to a half guard, whatnot, okay? And the rules were supposed to be, no rules, right? No headbutts, no this. So long as we get to the fight, everybody, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Wild West show. I mean, everything's crazy. Nothing is organized, per se. Uh, Brian Gumbel, uh, I did an interview with Brian Gumbel. That was a great interview. We talked about essence of martial arts that was kind of cool i don't know if that that's available so that was great um but one of the things that happened is that i was really angry because i hadn't been involved in the earlier shows yeah. so me and me and cal worsham get into it we'd start verbal talking i told cal worsham i was gonna kill him i told cal i said cal i'm gonna kill you cemetery dead and i meant it <laughs> um 
Yeah. Okay. And the name I switched my name from being nasty, nasty name Frazier, that I was gonna be in I was on a team all by myself called Murder Incorporated, right? Wow. After Frank after Frank Costello, those guys. So now I'm taking I'm going back and forth to train wrestling with the guys in Arizona. Uh and I'm now I'm different mentality, different mindset. I'm coming in to do this thing, right? So we get there, we get to the venue, um, and a um captain for the Detroit Police Department comes in full dress blues, Zane Frazier, yes, sir. Literally hands me a paper. We have a warrant for your arrest. What do you mean warrant for arrest? You're participating in the legal street fight. Um, and I was going, well, wait a minute. And, it, we, we, and we, my, my team was like, what the heck is going on? I mean, so we said, arrest? And, I said, and so he goes, and then he said, now, you can participate in the fight. You can't throw a close, you can't throw a strike with a closed fist. You can't throw any elbows. You can't do anything like that, right? So I said, okay, we can beat this guy, take him down and whatever, right? So I'm mad, I'm super angry. I said, are you gonna tell my opponent the same thing? Mm -hmm. And go, yes. By the time we got out to the cage, Cal was already in the ring. Wow. They did, he didn't have the same rules. Wow. So we told the guy, wait a minute, the guy right here, our opponent doesn't have the same rules. He said, I don't care what, it, and this guy was a big, tall, black dude, man. He was like, I don't even look like, uh, like uh, this actor. I can't think of his name. It was in, uh, uh, I forget this guy's name, but uh, it was a tall, tall guy. He was very, I mean, he was like mean. He was mad at me. He was like, if you throw one close fit punch, your ass is going to jail. <laughs> and we're sitting there, and he was like, he goes, and he said, and he, had, he had guys by our, by our, 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 where we were, by the ring, by our, where our team was. And he goes, I said, Goes, this guy ain't kidding. So I'm sitting there going into ring. I'm going, and I'm walking in there thinking, how the heck am I going to do this, right? So the fight goes on. I kind of not really into it. And second, I overtrained for that fight. I ran five miles on Monday, and, and it was raining in Detroit because I wanted to be so prepared for that fight, not thinking that I was over. I'll be overtrained by the time the fight comes, right? So I'm training. I'm training every day. I'm training hard. I'm getting there. And I'm just tired. I'm just this, whatever. But I said, I'm going to beat this guy. I don't care if I'm trying to beat Cal Warshaw. I'm going to kill this dude. So I kind of moved on him and I threw a knee and I heard, I heard a bunch, I heard, felt um, something crack. I felt it on my knee, something crack. Yeah. And then um, we wind up, we wind up, um, we wind up, um, uh, he wind up taking me down to the ground and Cal, I, they told me I had to come in and weigh in 205. I had to drop 30 pounds for that fight. Cal came in weighing about 275. Holy shit. Yeah, so I'm, I, so I'm, you look at my body, go look, you look at my body, it's all soft and whatnot. I'm crack, I'm cracking up, right? So anyway, so he's, he gets me in, I get put him in a half car, and all of a sudden, I can't move this guy. Cal is strong. I mean, he's strong, strong, strong. This guy is strong, good, get him off me. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing for the first time, this jujitsu stuff don't work. And when it comes to big guys, I'm just thinking, it don't work, it can't, it can't work. So anyway, uh, or I don't know enough of it. It's probably what it was, more or less than anything else. So Cal starts headbutting me. And I'm telling, I'm looking up John McCarthy. Don, there are no headbutts. John, stand us up. I'm telling John to stand us up. Stand us up. John doesn't stand us up. And I'm yelling, John says, they ain't fighting. They ain't John, there ain't no headbutts. And this and that. So, wow, so long. So, so Cal was just beat. He was just, he was just headbutting me, headbutting me. And I just, you know what? I tapped out. I said, I'm, and, I, and I was just pissed off. I said, I'm done. I ain't going to sit and take a whole bunch of punishment over a, a, a fixed fight. And I said, this, this, is, this is ridiculous. So I got in to Bob Meyer, what's his face? And I told him, I said, Bob, you guys did this, you did this. Zane, don't worry about it. We'll get you back to another show. I said, Bob, you guys have been doing this. You're doing that, da, 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 da. I was angry with him. So we go to the after party. So everybody comes up to me and says, hey, man, your guy's not going to make it. And I says, well, I don't know why he's not going to make it to the after party. I'm the one who lost. I'm thinking right there. And they go, no. They go, Cal is not going to make it. What do you mean? I said, what do you mean he's not going to make it? He goes, he's in the hospital, man. They say he's dying. I go, what? And they go, he says, he's dying. And I go, yeah, I'm making this up. And then so Bob Marwitz and those guys come up to me and say, hey, Zane, in the event that Cal doesn't make it, we cannot have you go on TV telling people you're going to kill him. Yeah. Uh, that you tried to kill him. I says, I says, well, what are you guys talking about? He goes, well, in the press conference, you said you're going to kill him, cemetery dead. Wow. Uh, guess what? And I said, oh, so, so 
we don't know. He's on. Uh, so what happened is when I finally had a chance to, uh, I got to LA, he was in the hospital in Michigan for about a month, maybe a little bit more than that. And he had four broken ribs, a punctured lung, and a bone had broken off and punctured his heart. And his heart was hemorrhaging. Holy shit. And they didn't know how to stop the bleeding from his heart internally. And then so when I finally got to, um, uh, I'd call the hospital every day because White Cow had four young kids at the time. I want to say he was a correction officer and his wife, everybody, we we're all worried. We we're all praying for him, putting the pull through. And I call the hospital room every day, every day. I called every day. I mean, I called every day. He's like, oh, he's not awake. It's just that. One day I finally just called and he wait. Hey, man, Cal, yeah, Zane, how you know, man? And we prayed on the phone and we're glad that he was okay. And uh, and uh, so that was kind of, um, that was always kind of a tough fight because one, it was a turning point, I believe, in the UFC because Don Fry's fight with Armin Patesh uh, is very brutal. Uh, which led me to go realize that wrestling and submission and catch wrestling was superior to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu when it came to Valley Tudo fighting. Um, Mark Schultz had told me that because Mark Schultz put on a clinic that night with Gary Goodridge. Uh, he was training Pedro Sauer, and they both told me you need to go to Arizona and train wrestling. So that was kind of a turning point for me as a fighter to finally realize here's what works because a lot of my fights, there was no sparring. Guys, I crack up. Guys get a chance to bar. Guys get a chance to enjoy a sparring camp. What is that like, guys? We would get a fight and you show up and fight. There's no sparring. You can go boxing, maybe do a little bit of kickboxing, but to do Valley Tudor or MMA sparring. Nobody was doing it. Yeah. The only person who was close to doing it was probably Eric Paulson and the shoot wrestling guys, but they were still doing what they weren't doing like Valley Tudor style for heavyweights anyway. Yeah. How the heck was Cal able to finish that fight? Well. What, what I would say is that I'm not sure per se, but I saw other fighters doing some recreational stuff back then that was legal. Guys were, got, guys were taking, guys were taking, uh, now I don't know if Cal was, I can't say that. Now I, wanna, uh, I don't want to say that about him, but I'm going to tell you, we personally saw guys doing a line of um, Coke, uh, guys are doing amphetamines, guys are doing all kinds of stuff. Guys were uh, shooting themselves with New Bane, uh, uh, not to feel any pain. Yeah, guys are taking all kind of stuff, and I'm like, well, shit, maybe I should be taking some stuff, man, because I don't know. Uh, and so for a long time, I believe that uh, a lot of those guys it had to do with their diet and their toughness. But I, Cal was a tough guy anyway. I mean, he he was a real tough dude. To take to take nothing away from him because you know um, he was able to beat me down and hold on. And whatever his body was going through at the time, the adrenaline kicked in, and you know he was able to become. Uh, uh, victorious over me in that fight. So I, I like to think it's Cal's toughness at that point because, um, uh, and I believe so because I now, if I recall, um, they said as soon as he got out of the cage, he collapsed. That's what happened. Now yeah. he, collapsed, he collapsed right when he, right as soon as he came out of the cage, he collapsed. Wow. So, you know, and, and, and here's what I would say to, 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 to kind of not sound sacrificial and, or, or self-righteous it's a good thing that the world did not see that in the cage. Cause if it yeah. doesn't, there's no Dana White, there's no UFC, there's none of that. Be done. So yeah. we're, we're, we were done. We would have given the world the ammunition they would have done. Uh, they needed to close the sport down. So it's a good thing the world didn't see that uh, him collapse coming out of there. Cause I, if I recall, he, I think he collapsed outside of, uh, outside of the, um, the cage, as soon as he got out of the cage, he fell and they put him, rushed him to the ambulance because they know what happened. So, yeah, yeah, like off camera kind of thing. Yeah, it was off camera kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Like you said, I mean, the UFC, as we know it right now, would not have happened. There's yeah. no way. That, that's that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that was just, and 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 we, um, uh, and, and what I, what's what's interesting about it today is that you got a lot of fighters who are trained. And guys are getting in shape for this stuff now. You're not, you can't just go in there like we did um, and not train for this. Although, although we were, although we were um, training for it, uh, we weren't training like guys are today and like we can now because the technology wasn't there. I remember going to sports specific coaches, a guy out here in Arizona, Mark Fasagan. He uh, was a founding creator of Athletes Performance, it's now called EOS. 
I'm not doing a shot spot for this guy. <laughs> it's all but, good. But, 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 I, but I just I, I just want to tell this this thing. So I went to Mark and I showed him a video of UFC. He goes, I said, how do you train for this? He looked at me and said, I don't know. Yeah. He's all I can tell you is that you got two energy systems, a strength system and an endurance system, and the skill component, the factors in it. You got to figure out how you're going to train for that, but that's going to be based on your uh, attributes and your skill ability. And we don't know how to tell you how to do that, right? Yeah. So I turned to a lot of the guys who are training NFL to strength and conditioning coaches to somewhat give us some guidance on how to do that, in particular position, a uh, cornerback, wide receiver, and middle linebacker. Right. Because you got to be strong enough to play the run and you gotta be quick enough to, uh, to, to, to play the pass. Yeah. So that's kind of where I, that's kind of where direction I went in is that, okay, let me find guys who train a specific position in the NFL. What do I have to have to be fast, strong for an extended period of time? Yeah. So your, your last fight was January, 2008. Uh, yes. You and I had talked a little bit earlier about retirement and you told me, you said, actually, you said I never retired. So uh, let's hear from you about your non-retirement. So um, I went a title in 2005. So let me tell you a short story. Mark Kerr. So Mark Kerr, I'm wrestling here 15 years. Seven years of that, I couldn't get a takedown on a wrestler if I wanted to. I couldn't buy a takedown. I couldn't go to the 99 and buy a takedown. I don't get a takedown on any wrestler. I'm talking, you know, and this, I'm talking the first generation because Bader, Ryan Bader, C.B. Dalloway, Cain Velasquez, Jamie Varner, all those guys are the second and third generation wrestlers here in Arizona. I'm talking about the first generation, right? Yeah. You know, that's, that's Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman, Van Ar Mike Van Arsdale, Kevin Jackson, Melvin Douglas is my wrestling coach. Um, a lot of the guys I couldn't buy, I couldn't get a takedown for seven years. Finally get a takedown, start learning, and Melvin Douglas has trained me every day uh, for seven years. And I finally started to become not just good, but really, really good, Okay. Uh, and so Melvin says, you're ready. And so I started training with Kerr, uh, and I took Mark Kerr down a few times and Mark goes, Oh my goodness. So Mark and I didn't live too far from him. He called me over his house. He's saying, I'm going to tell you right now, the best thing you ever happened to you is you learn how to wrestle, but it's also been the worst thing happens. Why? Ain't nobody going to want to fight you now. Cause now you can punch kick and you can take people down. You can take people down. So I have a title fight for this world w WFC. That was supposed to be the next big coming thing. Um, and I won a belt there. And I couldn't get a fight for three years. Holy I called Monty Cox. Monty, can I fight Tim Sylvia? I'll fight him for free. Zane, Monty Cox, exact words. We're not going to fight you till you're 60. I ain't letting my guys <laughs> nowhere near you guys. So I tried to get a fight. I called the UFC. I called Joe Silva. Joe, Zane, who you with? I said, there's nobody to be here. I said, the guys that are running camps here, I trained them. Why am I going to train them? So, so that was the kind of thing. So I didn't want to drive back to or go back to California because my wife and I had a different purpose to do that. Uh, being here in Arizona. So um, I'm trying to get a fight. I'm calling everybody. Then I had to take a couple what they call pro wrestling fights in Japan to make them make the ends meet. So again, going back to what I did in California, I always had a martial arts studio. But this time, I secured a contract with Gold's Gym at the time of Arizona, which are now EOS. And I had the contract for bringing kickboxing fitness with bags to the state of Arizona because my wife and I we're doing in California. And I was a co-collaborator on that because Billy Blanks was coming up, had came up with Tybo, but I was teaching karate size at the same time that he was, he's creating, Tybo started to formulate. But I was teaching karate size as a boxing, kickboxing, women's self defense program. And so what I essentially was doing was teaching that inside the health clubs. So when I was able to uh, bring that to the Phoenix, Arizona market, my wife and I were, we had worked on getting a, project together in 2008 that was going to get funded as a 125 million dollar health club and we got funded for that and the economy collapsed in 08 september 08 but let me go all the way back to the fight in january of 08 so now i'm working in the fitness industry i'm trying to make this deal happen we're doing things. i get a fight guy says hey man i got a title fight for you zane um uh can you fight i says shoot man i haven't sparred in about three years uh i haven't sparred since 2005 Sure, I'll take the fight. That's just how those go. You, those phone calls don't come. So, hey, let me go. All right. I haven't trained a bit. Come off the couch, doing cardio kickboxing classes and boxing classes and teaching kids agility camps. Okay, I can put some punches together. This guy ain't that hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, so I hadn't sparred, hadn't wrestled, hadn't grappled with anybody in three years. Just doing bag work and conditioning, running, keep standing in shape, like stuff like that. So I get to the fight. 
bring Russ showed, and all of a sudden I said, oh man, you gotta be kidding me. So I used to remember a guy in Texas had died um, in, in November or December 2007, I wanna say, right around right there. And so, because he was taking too many punches. So Texas don't let you take pun punishment like that. I figured, ah, oh, let me weather the storm. This guy get tired and I'll, I'll, I'll get him on the flip end. And long for sure, start, you know, they stopped the fight. So I said, oh man. So I said, all right, let me start training. So I started training in 2008. I go to a doctor's checkup. Uh, routine checkup that I always go after my fight. And I had started to develop rhabdomyolysis. That was because the summer 2007, I tried to do this military style training, which is I was creating myself, some friends of my own Navy SEALs and training weather that was 110 degrees, 120 degrees, something like that. So I started to develop rhabdo, but I didn't know it. Doctor tells me I had to shut everything down for 18 months. Yeah. No, no running, no lifting, no boxing, nothing. 18 months. Okay. And so I do that. I'm working the fitness side of things, work on the business, stuff like that. My father dies in September, right on my birthday, September 2008. So then after that, uh, my wife and I lost 19 family members in a row for the next 12 years, Sorry to hear. 19 family years. And so we were, we were just, I had to, our brother committed suicide. Um, my sister died. My father died. Her, her, her father died. Um, so we were, we were, we just in this tremendous, uh, place in our life where we're fighting through all these different things and trying to get through it. And I'm trying to get a fight and I couldn't get a fight guys. I said, Hey, I, I get in shape and I was mad and angry. I couldn't get a fight from, I just couldn't get a fight. So I said, you know what? Um, here's what I'm going to do. So I called Chuck Liddell. I said, Chuck, I can't get a fight. And Chuck had told me, um, uh, several years saying, hey, we're going to take over your career for you. Come up and train. And I get up and train, doing my conditioning, and I rupture my Achilles tendon. Yeah. So now I had to, now I had to, you know, uh, I had to wait a little bit. I had to get that repaired, rupture bicep tendon, had several eye surgeries. Um, um, that was just because I was a, a high dose of asthma medication that will, you know, bring in cataracts and things like that. So I said, you know what, I'm going to wait for the right time to come back because what I believe was going to happen. What I wanted to happen that this was going to have to go full circle, which is I said back in 2009, I said mixed martial arts and combat sports are going to go back to challenge matches where people are going to start calling people out for fights. And that's what's going to bring the popularity back to the sport and bring the excitement back. So I said, you know what, I'm going to train for that. And keep in mind, I started my preparing my comeback in um, December 1994, because I believe the sport was going to evolve. So with basketball, the, when by playing basketball, you saw that you go from Magic Johnson to Michael Jordan, the yeah. guys who didn't evolve from Magic Johnson, to Michael Jordan out of the league, right? You don't, you're not, you're not that guy anymore. Yeah. So um, I started to think the same thing in M MMA. I said, where's it going to go? It's got to go to wrestling. So I said, I'm going to go where the sport is going to be and wait for it. And then when it comes around again, I'll be able to return to fight because Chuck said it's better not to fight. Chuck gave me some great advice. He said, saying it's better not to fight than to fight and keep losing matches or fight, you know, something that doesn't mean anything or um, uh, you're not going to get a shot at the UFC guys because the Dana White tried to build it. Chuck didn't tell me this, but I knew that Dana White was trying to build the UFC and there was no way he was going to let some the older guys come in and beat on the younger guys when you're trying to build it. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So I just said, okay, let me fight any smaller shows. And I'd call up uh, King of the Cage or Gladiator Challenge. And, oh, yeah, okay, Zane. And couldn't get a guy to show. They said, hey, man, that guy's still fighting. There's two things. One, he's not a good fight because why? He's probably old and out of shape. But two, if that guy's in shape and he's coming back and fighting these lower shows, that's the guy you don't want to fight. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it, Mark Kerr was right. He told me, he said, Zane, as soon as you get out that you're not a wrestler like that, Ain't nobody gonna want to fight you now. Yeah. So that's what happened. So I never retired. That was just my last fight. Right. So so I said to I said so I so um so I said to myself I said well here's what I'll do I'll wait and see what's going on. Now this bare knuckle boxing is very interesting to me. I think that's something that uh, is is going to go back to reignite combat sports again. Um, and I think again what what Joe what what uh, uh, everybody's angry at was it John Paul Logan Paul. Uh, yeah. Jake Paul, Jake Paul, Jake, Jake Paul. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing everything. He's doing exactly what the Gracie's did 30 years ago. Yeah. Call people out. I mean, he called yeah. people out. Yeah. Right. I mean, who? I can't be mad at the guy. In fact, I, this is what I predicted was going to happen is that, and I think this is, I think this is going to be the future sport. Somebody somewhere, I don't know who, 
but somebody's going to do like they did in that movie, The Warrior. They're going to put up $10 million and say, bring your best fighter. Yeah. Somebody's going to put yeah. up, somebody's, now you have the streaming service on their, on their, on their investment, but somebody's going to come up and put up a, a, a show, whether it be some arena or somewhere, and they're going to say, hey, guys, we got $10 million to invite your best your fighter. It's going to be some kind of tournament. And that's what's going to bring the, now you got, now, because there's no more secrets. You got to remember something. The Gracies actually had secrets. Of course they did. did. Yeah. They had secrets, right? Yeah. So now what we, what, what, what was the secret that Gracie's had that going back to what I said earlier, it was the first generation of martial arts. That's what we always knew. There's no different than that. We knew the middle generation was for meditative, restorative, the yoga part of it, the sport aspect of it was for sport. But if you combine the first generation with the third generation, what do you have? You have the fourth generation of karate fighters that we see now. So I believe that the secret is that there are no more secrets. Right. So now when everybody's got wrestling, everybody's got jujitsu, everybody's got Muay Thai, everybody's got karate, everybody's got kickboxing. Now let's see the styles and the individuals come back. Now let's find out who the real fighter is. Yeah, that'd be awesome. See, yeah. so that's, that's kind of where I think it is going to have to go at some point, yeah. only because of the fact that there you got too many organizations. Um, and it'd be great if I think somebody can capitalize on that. You can have a world MMA world championship. Doesn't mean that, you know, say, say you have Francis Nagano or, or um, he's the UFC heavyweight. He fights in a tournament like that. He loses, he gets yeah. beat up. Well, that doesn't mean that Francis Nagano is not the UFC heavyweight champion. I mean, he's just not the world Muay Thai. Or he, it doesn't mean that Francis Nagano is not the UFC heavyweight champion. He's just not the world MMA world champion. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But I think that's yeah. what I, I think that's what the streaming platform and the and the and calling people out. I think that's where it's going to go, which is what I was waiting for. So I just start. I've been training now. I just got cleared my doctor to go back to training now and and, and start really picking it up and get into uh, uh, see what happens after this COVID-19, see what shows are available and just uh, start to, to work my way back and to see essentially, um, uh, uh, and this is a story, I, I'm writing down a story, this comeback story, uh, because I believe that this, my story is highly unique. And for the most part, it's not about fighting, it's not about coming back. It's actually about telling people how not to quit, determination. That's right. Story, determination. So, so anyway, that's kind of how I, 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 that's how I looked at it. I never retired. I just couldn't get, I couldn't get a fight. Yeah. Zane, it's been fun. Oh, uh, thank you. Rick. Thanks very much for, uh, for coming on today. I'd love to have you back. I know that we had talked about earlier some stories that never came out actually in the recording. And uh, I'd love to get back into some of it with you and uh, sure. chat a little more with you another time. This is Zane Fraser. Thank you for joining me on Inside the Minds podcast.